What's up guys, Mason the Brock Henderson here, and this is Fargo Season 3, Episode 3, The Law of Non-Contradiction. So, another really good, really interesting episode. Um, and honestly, coming off of... What I, what I gotta admit is kind of a bizarre episode. And really, I'm assuming this is gonna connect later. I, I have to assume that, because if I don't, then this episode doesn't really have any meaning. Um, because what it is, is kind of a, I guess, a look into who Anastasi slash uh, Thaddeus, whatever, uh, looking into his life and finding out about him. It's very interesting, and it is, a, it is an interesting story. However, considering that that had nothing to do with his death, it really doesn't tie into the main plot at the moment. Um, I'm assuming, though, that not that there's no way that they could have just used this entire episode for nothing that's going to tie in later. Um, I don't know if maybe this story about this robot is going to tie in, or if maybe, you know, the Walker Zimmerman, or, or no, Howard Zimmerman, uh, or Vivian, are, if they're going to tie in at all later on, but I have to assume that Ennis, Stussy, Thaddeus, uh, Mobley, I, I have to assume that they're going to tie in to the main plot somehow. You know, it's not just going to be all about the Stussy brothers and their feud. The fact that they dove so far deep into this story about who Thaddeus Mobley was tells me he's going to be an important character later on. Um, so I don't know how, I don't know how it's all going to tie together, but the story that they told in this one was interesting. Uh, very, very well told, very... Very interesting to see just kind of what this guy had to go through, you know, kind of being touted as this this genius writer by this guy named Howard Zimmerman who wants to produce his movie, wants to produce his book as a movie, and so he's asking him to write the script, but then apparently it doesn't work out, and so we see that the whole time they just wanted to use him to try to make a, a blockbuster movie and make money off of him. And so, you know, Vivian was sleeping with him. He thought that they had something, and of course they didn't. And so, you know, Howard's trying to convince him, hey, just write, and that's all you have to do. And, of course, that is just, like, freaking out because he's like, uh, no, I, I don't, <laughs> this isn't right. Um, and so, ultimately, <clears throat> Howard tries to kind of force him to do what they're bidding. And he fights back and uh, bashes Howard's head in and throws Vivian up against the wall and then runs out and leaves. And I assume this is how he ended up leaving L.A. in the first place because, you know, he goes in, throws up after what he did, sees the name Dennis Stussy and Brothers, but the D is marked out, so it's Ennis Stussy. And so that's how he gets his fake name, and I assume he just fled the, the state and went to Minnesota to live in isolation. And, of course, you know, ended up marrying Gloria's mom later. So all that's pretty much his story as a whole. But it's very well told. It's It does a very good job of kind of keeping the emotion there as well as kind of seeing Gloria's side of the story as well. We get to flash forward to the present and see what she's kind of going through at the moment. You know, to see her talking to these different people, see her kind of experiencing L.A. Um, and it's very, very harsh. <laughs> you know, like, I... It, it makes sense because the people in L.A., you know, not saying anything bad about L.A. in general, but you will find more people there that are jerks than you probably would find in Minnesota. You know, the people there, it's more of a small town, so the people there are closer. You go over to L.A., and it's like the cop that she ends up meeting just wants to sleep with her. And so he's like, listen, am I getting laid tonight or not? Um it's just, it's very harsh compared to Fargo and, you know, the stuff that she goes through up there. Uh, and I, I don't know, I just, I do like the comparison, but at the same time I felt kind of bad for, you know, being such a, such a caring person in general. It kind of sucks to see her have to go through all of that. Um, so yeah, that was, it was nice seeing both of their stories kind of combining and coming together. And of course, it all ends with both of them ending up at the toilet for different reasons, you know. Uh, Thaddeus ends up there because of what he just did, you know, the horrible thing he did, and she ends up there because she's finally deciding to leave and accidentally drops something, <laughs> so it was more of an accident. But um, as far as looking forward, like I said, the the story of the little robot, I'm 
I'm still kind of wondering what this is all about. Uh, of course, the storytellers on Fargo do a very, very good job of kind of making connections that you know the audience can figure out. Right now, I can't think of anything that this robot story relates to. So, like I said, maybe it'll tie in later. I'm, I'm hoping, I'm thinking maybe that's what's going on. Uh, just because it is a very interesting story. You know, we have this robot who ends up on, I'm guessing, like a primordial Earth. And the person who went there with the robot dies in the crash. And so the robot's told to send signals back to the mother planet and, like, just keep sending all this information back as it gets more information. And so <clears throat> we see the robot just going through all these different stages of, I guess, Earth sort of building itself and then, you know, everything falls apart and then builds itself back up again, falls apart again. And then at one point it looks like it ended up in, I guess, like, post-apocalyptic world, you know, everything's destroyed. Uh, there's even one scene where it grabs a human arm in the rubble and tries to put it on its uh, arm that got taken away. And so it's kind of a sad but also interesting story. And by the end of it, we see <clears throat> that the robot, you know, I guess the, the signal it was sending back to its home world, I guess, were being received the entire time because all of a sudden a UFO shows up, drops people out of the UFO, and they start shooting everybody on Earth. And the robots get taken, and these people, one of them uh, I sounded like Merlin from uh, like uh, the Disney channel or Disney movie Merlin, but he all of a sudden just starts talking to him like, "You did such a good job, and now we're going to now you can shut yourself off. Your time is done." So it feels like the moral of the story was, you know, the robot, even though it felt like nothing was really happening, even though it felt like this journey was pointless. It was actually doing its job correctly the entire time, and it wasn't until the end of the journey that it finally got to see the reward of what it went through. And after all of that was said and done, it was finally time for it to finally rest. Now, is this kind of a comparison of what Thaddeus' life was like? Maybe. You know, he was very old. He did go through a lot. He did see a lot. Um, I don't exactly know, you know, maybe this information that he was gathering through all this time on the Earth Maybe it's going to help Gloria somehow. I don't know. Um, but, yeah, it was it was just kind of interesting to see, and I'm, I'm hoping that we do kind of get to see what this story was meaning and what, what the overall meaning was to our present-day story. Uh, another thing that just I don't really know how it connects, uh, there was a box inside of the, uh, the closet where Gloria was staying, and so she's looking at the box, and all of a sudden she puts it on the bed, flicks the little thing, it opens, and a little finger pops out and pushes it back. And it's like the little, if you've seen like the little cat boxes where you touch the thing, the cat pops up, closes it, and pops back into the box. Pretty much the same thing, except this one looked like it was a middle finger doing it. I didn't really get to see a good look at it, but it looked like a little middle finger like coming out and pushing it and flicking you off at the same time. But whatever that was, like, it was something I'm just like, what is this supposed to be? At the end of the robot story, we see the robot open up its head and flick itself off. And when it does, it looks like the little switch that was on the box that Gloria was flicking off, on and off. So, either this is kind of like the box is supposed to represent, like, this is what the robot became... And so whenever you try to turn it on, it's like, no, my journey's done, fuck you. <laughs> it just turns itself back off. Uh, I don't really know exactly how this is supposed to connect, but it's interesting, and it's got me curious, and I hope it gets explained. I, I hope this wasn't just something that we were supposed to figure out in this episode. If it is, I missed it. Uh, but it's got me very, very curious, and it's kind of like uh, the story at the beginning um, at the very first episode, I actually didn't talk about this because it didn't seem like it connected at first, but I really did like the story that they were telling where the man is inside of this prison and, you know, he's been living in this house and apparently somebody was killed and the guy who was living at the house he's living at was named somebody completely different and killed uh, his girlfriend, but he's not that guy and the girl that was killed even though it has the same 
name is his wife, not his girlfriend. And so this guy is just like telling him, no, you are this person. And just pretty much convinced and trying to convince him as well that the state, the, the government is not wrong. You're the one that's wrong. And then at the end of all of it, he says, what you're telling is a story. You know, it's not the, the truth. And so at, after all that said and done, of course, we go to this is a true story. And then it cuts off the true like it always does. And this is a story. And so it's the story part of it, it, it's like, oh, that's interesting. Well, in this episode, after Gloria finds out what happened at the end of Thaddeus' story, you know, at, at the end of everything that happened between him and Zimmerman and Vivian, at the end of it, she's just like, do you think this might connect, connect in any way? You know, maybe Howard, maybe he ordered somebody to, and then she's like, no, this is just a story. So you were kind of starting to get to see the, the reoccurrence of the term story thrown in there. And it's a different meaning every time, you know, the story that the show is telling, the story that the guy at the beginning of the show was trying to tell, you know, the story of Thaddeus. All these stories mean something completely different, and I hope it continues, and I hope we start to get more comparisons and more parallels, because that's what the show does really, really well. You know, they just, they tell this very interesting story of one thing. You know, in the first season, it was about this one guy who kills his wife and then all of a sudden starts to get confidence in himself and covers up the crime, but also has to deal with his demons constantly coming up to haunt him. And second season, similar thing. You know, this woman kills a guy accidentally, but then tries to hide it up. It ends up causing this war, this feud between pretty much the mob and then <laughs> a family, a crime family. And she and her husband are caught up in the middle of it. And it's her just trying to cover it up, but still kind of dealing with her own demons as well. And then this one so far, it seems like it's just been a story about these two brothers who are feuding. One of them tries to have this one guy steal from his brother, but he goes to the wrong house, kills the guy in the process, and then the Stussy brother ends up killing him in the process. And so it seemed like that was going to be the story of just them, those two brothers feuding and all the people caught up in their wake, but now all of a sudden Ennis's story come up comes up in it as well. It's just like, what does this all mean? How is this all going to tie together? That's what I love about this show. It it just grabs my attention. It makes me want to know what's going to happen next. How is this all going to tie together? How is this going to come to the ending of the story? I don't know, but I'm really looking forward to it. So now I'm going to go and probably eat some Arby's because they talked about it a lot at the end and. It was kind of funny, but it was also kind of sad because it, it came right after the, the scene where we see Gloria and her son at, I guess, Ennis's viewing, and they're the only two there. And I'm just like, that's really sad. Like, nobody, when she's over in L.A., nobody really knew about him. And so they get back, and nobody really knew about him here either. So it's like, the entire time, nobody really knew who he was. Nobody knew what he was really there for and so it's like he just went under the radar this entire time it's like that sucks maybe that's part of the robot story as well hmm. but yeah the, at the end of it they do make a joke about arby's though it's just like you want to go to arby's and just like oh look product placement and all of a sudden her cop friend shows up uh the guy that she works with i guess it's her partner and she's like, what, do you show up whenever Arby's is mentioned? And he's like, oh, you're going to Arby's. I'm <laughs> just like, now I really want Arby's. Screw you, product placements. Um, and, yeah, so I'm really looking forward to seeing what's going to happen next. Uh, the final thing I do want to mention, because I, I wanted to talk about it in the first two episodes, and I completely forgot both times, but the music is back. And maybe it was in the second season as well, and I just don't remember but there's like this orchestral music that played in the first season. Like whenever they showed FX Presents Fargo, there was always like this, viol like this violin, choir, orchestra, whatever, playing this just really solemn, really sad music. And I don't really remember it being in season two. And it kind of made sense because the first season was set more present day, second season was set back in the past, so... It kind of makes sense that they wouldn't have the same music, but now that we're back sort of kind of in present day, you know, 2010 is a bit more present than 19, was it 70-something? Uh, 
but they have that choir music back in, and it didn't start off the episode, but it ended on that, you know, as they're driving off, that sad music is playing again, I'm just like, I love the music on this show, you know, aside from that, obviously the other music is, is good as well, but just that song, that choir music in general, is just so good, <laughs> it's, it really gets me kind of emotional when I listen to it, and it really just, gives me chills. I still remember there's one episode in season one where it was like things were going on, you know, this, it wasn't that music, it was something else going on, and then all of a sudden, you know, as that music's going on, they're eating in some restaurant, and it's the music inside the restaurant, all of a sudden it starts fading out and starts fading into the Fargo music, and I'm just like, oh my god, it, it gave me so many chills because it was so awesome. So I love having that music back, and Hopefully we continue to have more of it throughout the season. Um, so that's about it for this episode, though. Let me know what you guys think down in the comment section below. What were your thoughts on this episode? What do you think this is all leading to? Let me know. We can talk about it, discuss all the good stuff. Leave a like and subscribe for future Fargo reviews, and I'll see you at the next one. Peace out.